Doug Sesserman, privileged to serve as the CEO of Americans for Ben Gurion University, and it's hashtag Webinar Wednesday. Today we have a great program featuring Neil Meyerberg on what to expect with tax law changes in 2022. But before getting too far into the program, I want to begin by thanking Melody Mokhtarian, our Director of Events and Experiences, who works so hard behind the scenes. I believe this is our 39th webinar uh, since the pandemic. And also Liz Kirshner and others who have us live on Facebook, or we're trying to be live on Facebook, and spreading this good word throughout social media. I also want to thank our community partners who uh, helped get the word out for today's program. Uh, Congregation B'nai Amuna in St. Louis, the Jewish Endowment Foundation of Louisiana, the Jewish Federations of Greater New Orleans and also of Nashville and Middle Tennessee, and Camp Young Judea of Texas. Those kids are very interested in tax planning. So thank you to our community partners. And for those of you, of you who are connected to other organizations that do pro-Israel work, we love it for Americans for Ben Gurion University to partner with you where our content fits into the programming of your favorite pro-Israel organization. So Neil, we have a fascinating topic. We had uh, close to 300 people register and we have uh, a, lot, a lot of people joining us today and the numbers are growing. So after COVID-19 um, vaccine and sex with Dr. Ruth, your, your, your topic has been one of the biggest draws we've ever done. Nice to know, thank you, Doc. So, so the, the only things that are certain in life are <clears throat> death and taxes. And I think people are thinking about their taxes these days. So Neil Meyerberg, who's an absolute expert and we're privileged to work with him, is a well-known authority on tax and financial planning strategies using charitable giving techniques. As an attorney and principal in the firm of Meyerberg Philanthropic Advisors, Neil provides consulting services to many of the country's top charitable organizations as well as individual philanthropists. He teaches a graduate level plan giving course at Columbia University and is a frequent speaker at national plan giving conferences, as well as a resource to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Dateline NBC. Uh, Neil is a regular presenter for Consumer Reports Magazine and programs throughout the country on tax and financial planning using strategies that involved being charitable. He's a graduate of the University of Baltimore, both for his undergraduate and law degree, and he has his master's from NYU. Neil, welcome to Webinar Wednesday. For those of you who have joined us before, you know how this program works, but Neil's gonna present some very interesting information. This webinar is called for 30 minutes. If you have a question, just click on the Q&A function and I'll be able to uh, get those questions to Neil as he's presenting. And we're gonna use the last 10 minutes, hopefully, to just take questions from the audience and promote some of our upcoming webinars. In fact, I'll do make one mention right now. Uh, please join us on Wednesday, October 27th for a webinar featuring uh, diversity and inclusion in Israel, how the Jewish state is also a shared society uh, with Professor Guy ben Parat and Professor Sarab Abu Rabia Quader, who's the new vice president, a Bedouin professor, who's the new vice president of diversity and, and inclusion at BGU. Okay, Neil, back to taxes. Okay. The floor okay. is all yours. Thank you. Hope you have the screen in front of you, everybody. Welcome and glad to hear and see everyone. Uh, this outline will be available to you if you like, by, uh, and you'll be told how you can acquire it. But by and large, I'm going to walk you through what is the great unknown. We think we know where the administration is. We think we know now where the changes will be, but we don't know because there's so much else going on on the Hill right now. But this issue of taxes, which became so prominent in the first part of this year, is, if not quiet, at least it's not front burner at this moment, but we need to know what we can do in light of what the changes would be. So let's take a look at where the president's administrative pieces were and what he believed in. We know that he campaigned 
on higher taxes on high income households and corporations. But for many of you on this call today or on this webinar today, you're going to be most concerned about how you'll be able to transfer assets to heirs. The income tax changes that were proposed by the administration would change the high rate to 39.6, as you can see here. And Neil, so, right, right now we can't see the, your screen, so you, you have to click on that share screen button if you can. I, I think, I thought I did, but let me try it again. Sorry. No worries, and if we have a technical glitch, then uh, our audience is just gonna have to look at you and me, which definitely is not as interesting. So maybe, I can get some help from our um, staff. All right, I'm going to put share screen on, please. And Don't worry about it. We'll just have a conversation and we can uh, send the copy of the email to the, the PowerPoint to those who are interested afterwards. Okay, does anybody see it now by any chance? On the screen. Sorry, let me just uh, go about it. I have it on the screen now, but I guess it can't be seen. But let me just uh, tell you a bit about what we're seeing. We're knowing that the tax law is going to try to raise uh, the individual income tax rates higher, and it's going to be rates higher on the high end of earnings. That doesn't mean if earnings are $400,000 above that it won't be for people with lower adjusted gross incomes, but we don't know at this point. We do know that the most consequential thing is there'll be a cap gains rate rise proposed for certain high net worth, high income people, 39.6% from 20%. And that's a consequential move that we have to be concerned about because even if it doesn't go to 39.6, it will certainly go above 20% and 20% is going to be a very consequential number to be above in order to try to deal with the issue of how you recognize capital gains. So essentially the estate tax overhaul was even more problematic. Uh, the issue of step up in basis has become considerably important to people. Uh, the rule has always been, if you left something in your estate to heirs and they received it at date of death, the basis they would take in order to sell those assets and pay any tax on gain would be the date of death basis of the owner. Well, there's talk now of eliminating the step up in basis so that when people receive assets, uh, at the end of lifetime of the um, grantor or the testator, those assets will be based upon those that person, the dead person's basis, which means the capital gain can't be considerable. And those capital gain, those unrealized gains during the person's lifetime would still be taxed at the end of lifetime by the receiving heir. The other issue is, which is important, that right now through 2021, there's $11.7 million unified credit exempt amount per individual or 22.4, million times two for a couple. And the discussion now is to reduce that to $3.5 million in transfers of death and $1 million in lifetime gifts. So the problem is that not only will the basis be lower, the exempt amount be lower, measurably lower, but they're gonna tax anything above that amount at 40% or higher. So you can see that right away, there's a considerable difference between what it is and what it might be. Uh, what's in the outline is a table that compares the two. It raises the income tax rate to 39.6 under the Biden plan. And in the House of Representatives, their plan is also at 39.6 for single filers or for head of households above 420 and for joint filers above $450,000 and a new 3% surcharge for certain individuals, which means that there will in fact be an increased individual income tax rate. Where it begins at is not known yet, but the house would begin it at $400,000 for head of households and 425 for individuals and 450 for joint filers. The second thing is the capital gains rate. And this is where the Biden plan and the house plan differs. In the Biden plan, there's a cap gain rate would go up to 39.6 for people over a million dollars in income over the 20% base it is now, whether it's gonna be raised above 20 for those below a million dollars in income is still to be discussed. Whereas the house plan says, instead of going to 39.6, we'll go to 25% and have a new surcharge on some income 
and a net investment income tax under current law will continue at 3.8%, makes the top federal marginal capital gains rate under the House plan could be close to 32%, the highest federal cap gain rate since the 1970s. If you add that rate to the high tax rate of some of our states where capital gains are also taxed, you could take the capital gain average rate to close to 37 or higher percent. Even in the House proposal, it's considerably higher. And lastly, if the amount of transfers estate and gift tax free is going to be reduced from 11.7 million in 2021 but $3.5 million in 2022 or thereafter under the Biden plan, or $6 million from 22 onward under the House plan, it's still going to be, in some instances, half of, in some instances, much lower than half of what the exempt amount is right now. And we should all remember that if nothing happened under current law, beginning in 2026 under prior law, the exempt amount is going to be $5.6 million. So in effect, we've got to deal with the what if and the what now. We know that if we waited until 2026, we'd be at $5.6 million anyway. But right now, we'll stay at 11.7, we'll go to 6.0, we'll go to $1 million, we'll go to 3.5, we don't know, which means we have to do some actions now. With regard to a, a uh, estate and gift taxes, the Biden plan eliminates a step up in basis. The House bill says no elimination of the step up in basis. On the Biden plan, capital gains tax will be assessed on the surviving spouse, for example, upon her sale of the property, and but there'd be no step up. For other heirs, tax will be assessed, no step up. Under the House bill, the tax for the surviving spouse will be based upon a step up. So again, significant differences between the administration and the House representatives. In the Biden bill, there will be some tax assessed on the non-charitable portion of certain types of charitable gifts. In the House plan, there would be no front end capital gains taxes on contributions of certain properties to certain charitable gifts, including charitable remainder trusts. There'll be valuation rules changed in the House. They're going to try to eliminate in the House bill valuation discounts for certain entities holding non-business assets like LLCs holding nothing but liquid marketable securities. The valuation discount will probably be not allowed if the House bill comes into effect. So you can see there's a difference measurably between the administration and the House. And we don't really know which way it's going to go, but likely it is going to be compromised. And the wild card, of course, will be the Senate, which will have to find its path through here. But right now it's the administration and it's the House. What kind of planning can you do in light of this? Things to think about now. You might want to harvest some long-term capital gains before the end of this year. I know you'll pay tax on them, but your tax costs will be much lower in 21 than they like it will be in 22 going forward. You may also want to use some of your highly appreciated stocks to do some charitable giving. You might put it in a donor advised fund. You might give it outright to some charities. You might create endowment funds or designated funds at charities. You might do it for Ben Gurion University. Any number of things you might be able to do to get rid of some high appreciated assets in 2021, because you don't want to sell them in 22 if the rate doubles, which it could do. Number two, since income tax brackets are lower for 21, they'll probably be higher than 22. Can you find a way to accelerate some income in this year? If there's bonus income, if there's deferred compensation, can you take it in 2021 before you get to the raise in rates likely happening in 22. Number three, maybe you want to take a look at some of the charitable vehicles for succession planning. A charitable remainder trust will take your, your appreciated assets at no tax on the initial contribution, and you can use it to make income for life for yourselves. You may pay income for life instead to children. You might use some replacement vehicles like life insurance within the trust revenues in order to replace assets for children at no estate tax or gift tax costs, or you might use a charitable lead trust, payments to charity during lifetime, and shift the assets to the next generation at present exempt amounts, $11.7 million, not using future exempt amounts, which will be much lower. And I guess your planners will talk to you in the case it applies to you of making some use of the $11.7 million in unified credit for estate and gift taxes before the end of this year. And right now, 
it's October 13th. The end of the year is coming. And, and lots of you are probably going to want to speak to your estate planners if you haven't already, or your tax planners, your legal and tax advisors, and decide what steps should we take now before end of the year, before we get caught in a maelstrom of changes to reduce our exempt amounts and to increase our rates and maybe to tax capital gains at end of lifetime with no step up in basis. Things to be concerned about. What hey, do we Neil, think? Yes, Doug. Th this might be a good time for, for one of our questions. All right. Uh, we're getting a question from, from Jeff Green, who's joining us from Israel. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, he's asking if Neil could relate to establishing trusts funded by annual gifts as a way to protect an elderly parent's assets before um, they may have to go into a memory care facility or something? Well, anytime one is able to make contributions during lifetime in anticipation of wondering what the future will bring can create a variety of types of trust. In the case that Jeff is mentioning, creating a trust uh, in which there would be a an annual payment to the person's ch charities uh, over lifetime uh, uh, would in fact take those assets out of the estate and would in fact get income tax deductions now and would be a way of planning for when one cannot do that. There are a variety of ways to do it and, and Jeff would be um, familiar with some of the things we've seen at the university and that's a concept we should talk about with individuals. Planning for that inevitability because it's not an inevitability becomes very difficult for lots of people. Now, I want to point out to everyone that uh, the idea of maximizing and accelerating your giving this year is important for a couple of reasons. One of which is this is the last year that you'll be able to use the 100% of AGI as the basis for deducting your gifts of cash. That means that if you make gifts of cash to charity in a variety of different ways before the end of the year, then you can deduct them fully up to the amount of your adjusted gross income. So what many planners are doing now with their clients is, the clients who are philanthropic, they're saying, let's generate some more adjusted gross income. Maybe we should take more money out of an IRA than the RMD. Let's build up adjusted gross income this year and let's make our charitable gifts going forward and accelerate them in this year so we can deduct them up to 100% of AGI. When we go into 22 and thereafter, we're limited to 60% of adjusted gross income. We may be going down to 50% of adjusted gross income. So giving gifts of cash to charity, either outright, create a fund, do a gift annuity, do a charitable remainder trust, do a donor advised fund for that matter, will be deductible up to 100% of AGI. So in 2021, Take advantage of that, fund up some of these income vehicles that you might want, fund up annuities, whether it be charitable annuities or commercial annuities, fund up charitable trusts or regular trusts, get assets out of your estate if possible, and use, if you don't take the itemized deductions, use the standard deduction this year for charitable gifts, either by an individual $300,000 or a couple 600, excuse me, $300 or a couple $600, as an above the line deduction. Take advantage of that. And lastly, for those of us, most of us who did not take RMDs in 2020, but must take them in 2021, take advantage of the IRA charity rollover. Take advantage of qualified charitable distributions and move some of those RMD dollars directly from your administrative partner at the IRA company to charities in order to avoid tax on those distributions. It's back. It's been the law. Most of us didn't do it in 2020. Many of us made our 2020 gifts early in 2021 to take advantage of the rule for IRA charity rollovers and again toward the end of the year. A couple right. of things. Yeah, we're getting a quick question on that. So the RMD is the re required minimum distribution from the IRA, correct? Correct. And so we're getting a question of if somebody wants to uh, use that as a charitable gift, how do, how do they do that? You make contact and, and, and people at A4BGU can help you with this. Make contact directly with your IRA administrator by letter and you say, please directly distribute to the following charities and the following amounts funds from my IRA and be certain you do it before the close of 2021. And they will send the funds directly to the charities on your list 
it doesn't get into your hands, which would be that you'd have to recognize income. You recognize no income. When you report the end of the year, RMD, say you have $100,000 and the charity has gotten $50,000, you're only going to have to report for tax purposes 50,000 of the 100. The other 50 that went to charity will be free of tax. It's merely an administrative step. Tell the IRA administrator what you want to do. We can help you with that, by the way, and avoid tax on that part of your RMD. And that also, if you have an inherited RMD, can you do the same thing? Same thing. If you're inherited the, RM, the IRA and you have to take RMDs, you can use those RMDs again as charitable gifts in order to avoid tax on that RMD. The, minute, the maximum amount of RMD you can avoid tax on to charity is $100,000. Anything from that number down, you can avoid tax on. Many people don't take RMDs that large, but many of you are philanthropic. And if you're 72, for example, now, you might want to make your charitable gifts this year from your RMD using the IRA charity rollover. And again, people at A4BGU can give you a sample, a sample letter document that you'll send to your IRA administrator to get this done. Let me just talk about a couple more things, and one of which is very important in your planning this year. Considering the changes in tax laws, considering that rates may go up, we have this issue of the elimination of the stretch IRA. Many of you in your planning over the years, I'm sure made a decision between spouses that if spouse is going to receive from dying spouse an IRA outright, that's going to be the normal rollover, spousal taxes over life expectancy. But if the IRA is going to go to children, for example, the rule of long-term distributions based upon life expectancy for most beneficiaries is now limited to 10 years, which means that those children who may be in their 40s, for example, will have to take all of this out of the IRA within 10 years and pay income taxes at an accelerated amount at higher rates. There's a lot of challenges now to deal with this. And the challenges are, how do you get the children to receive these distributions longer than 10 years and still have them secure in the receipt of assets like this at lower tax cost if possible? The simple answer that's been done even before now, but is now being accelerated in the planner's thinking is to use a charitable remainder trust that receives assets from the IRA at the end of the owner's lifetime. The trust is tax exempt. It receives assets uh, with charitable deduction components. It receives them at no income tax component from the dying owner of the IRA. The trust runs for life or lives, can be for multiple lives. So it can be for multiple children at a fixed rate so they can receive payments throughout their lifetime as opposed to only for 10 years. They'll pay tax only in the amount they receive and some of the receipt is tax preferred at the end of the lifetimes of all these beneficiaries, whatever remains in the trust will be passed on to the charity or charities you name in the instrument. That way, you've avoided the problem of heirs receiving the full asset value of the IRA while they're in a position that you'd rather they not be in. That is, you don't want them to receive it in that time of life. You wanted it to go on longer for them. That was the purpose of it. But you're able to do that without having to fall in counter to the 10-year distribution rules which now exist. It's called the removal or the elimination of the 10-year rule, the stretch IRA. The solution is for many planners using a charitable remainder trust. It's something you need to have calculated. You should confer with your planner. You can confer with us. We can show you how it works. It's just something to be considered because planning now, particularly planning for adult children who might be disabled is really becoming a challenge. So I encourage you to think through this concept, it's very important. So Neil, if I understand this correctly, because this, this is really important actually, the charitable remainder, remainder trust is an excellent vehicle for people to provide income to their beneficiaries while also doing some charitable planning uh, with, the, with the bulk of their assets, is that correct? Absolutely, and I'll add another piece to that, Doug. You, you said it out completely right. You're gonna take care of the children all of them or the ones you want to provide income for life. You're going to provide for charity in the future. And some planners may also add the following. If some of the resources coming out of the trust can be used to purchase insurance for the benefit of the children, that 
end of lifetime period when the trust is over, when assets go to charity, the life insurance vehicle will also mature and the death benefit can go to the children to a trust for the children. So what you're doing is you're giving it away in the charitable remain the trust, but income for life for the children, it's going to charity at the end and the asset value can be replaced all or a portion by this life insurance policy that will be free of gift and estate taxes. Doug, it's a phenomenal concept, needs to be explored. People oftentimes will look at it and look at all the options and look at the revenues and look at whether or not philanthropy and wealth replacement and protecting their children is a good plan in their estates. Thank you. I personally get very confused in this area because I'm not, a, not at all a tax expert. Um, so it's great that we have you available to, to people. If people do have questions and we'll put this uh, email up at the end also, you just write to plan giving at Americans for BGU spelled out dot org. Planned giving at Americans for BGU dot org. And we'll get your questions directly to Neil and, and get them answered. Yes, and as I mentioned earlier, Doug, because we don't have the outline on the screen, I'm welcome anybody who wants to have the outline to simply let us know when we certainly send it out to them so we'll see in visuals what we've been talking about um, verbally. A couple more We're getting a question, Neil, from an anonymous attendee. And um, she says that I'm 72 year old widow. Uh, who has my primary residence poured into a living trust? Should I transfer home ownership to my two grown daughters? Uh, so not to be considered in potential future Medicare or Medicaid calculations? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a question with a lot of pieces. There is a question of um, elder law, the question of uh, whether or not one can qualify for Medicaid by divesting assets and going through the period of time needed for that to be taken. It's based on state law more than federal law. So the question has lots of loose and moving parts, Doug. So I would suggest that uh, someone who specializes in elder law be conferred with by this individual to see whether that plan can work. That plan will eventually take the assets out of that estate and go to the children. It's a question about whether ownership of the house by the children as opposed to the trust will be in the best interest of the mom. So that's what I would urge that person. Okay. To. All right, thank you. We're also getting a question from Pam Singer. She's just asking about uh, how to make sure that where she finds information about charities, Jewish charities that are very efficient. Um, so one, I'll just answer this and then Neil, you can you can uh, add to it if you'd like. So uh, Charity, charity uh, Navigator is one of the well, most well-known uh, benchmarks, Pam. And you can just go to, I think it's charitynavigator.com or, or .org. And you can look us up as well as other organizations. I'm proud to say that for six years in a row, Americans for Ben Gurion University has received a four-star rating, which makes us one of the top 11% of all charities in terms of efficiency. But that's a good, um, that's a good watchdog group to check into. And also, Doug, because I think the question had a, maybe a second piece to it, you find the charities that you love, you find the charities that have high regard from Charity Navigator, for example, and you maybe you go into the, the charity's information. What you wanna be certain of is that some of the things we're talking about today can be uh, handled by the charities, whether they can give you advice either independently or through their own, set, their own counsel and can work with your professional advisors to make these things work. They sound complicated, but for many estate planners, they're not. And for many charities, they're not. So I would urge you when you talk to some of these charities, ask the hard question. How can you help me understand a child of Armenia trust? How can you help me understand an annuity? How can you help me understand how to make these contributions to you that will be beneficial, not only for the mission you have, which is important to me, but also for how I'm trying to pass assets to the next generation of my family. And it's a good okay, question. Great. This, this webinar was called for 30 minutes, but our audience is holding really strong. So we're going to go a little bit longer, if that's okay with you, Neil. I wish. Um, I'm, I'm happy for that. I, I yeah, think... El, Ellen Marcus is asking a question. Are you saying that one can donate a life insurance policy and therefore not pay future premiums? Well, that's interesting, Ellen. If the policy requires premiums still, if it's not... You know, for example, when you donate that policy to charity, 
you'll get a deduction for some portion of the value of that policy. That's how the mathematics work, but the, there's still premium to pay. So what people generally do is they'll contribute the policy now owned by the charity, but they'll make an annual contribution in addition to what they normally give the amount of the premium that the charity can use to make the payments and that will be deductible uh, if the charity That's correct so the premium ellen would be deductible but still needs to be paid if the individual who donates the life insurance policy doesn't pay the premium then the charity would need to to keep the uh, life insurance policy active Right. And so uh, some people will contribute paid up policies. Pretty easy to understand that. Some people will just make the charity the beneficiary of their current policy or one of the beneficiaries and continue to own the policy. And some, under Ellen's question, would, would transfer the policy to the charity. And since their premiums do, will continue to make the premium payments either directly to the insurance company or by an extra gift to the charity. So those premiums would be deductible as charitable contributions. We're also, Neil, getting a question from Lana Sternberg. Thank you for joining us. Uh, she's asking if the generation skipping trust is still in, an, in existence. Well, it is, but we don't know. And it's, it's one of the obscure pieces that we're trying to watch with the administration and the House, uh, the terms of what they're thinking about doing. They may be impacted, they may be unavailable going forward. And so again, if this is something very important in your planning, I would go to your tax advisors now and say, what can we do in case this has changed to secure what we've been trying to accomplish with this generation skipping transfer tax trust? Uh, I can't give you any encouragement because I don't know there's gonna be a lot of horse trading in the Congress, in the administration to get this bill or some portion of this bill passed. They wanted to have this bill passed this year and make it retroactive back to the spring of this year hopefully that's not going to happen and if they pass it in 22 i don't think we don't think they're going to make it retroactive to transactions in 21 that's why i urge all of you listening today to take some active steps even if they're not philanthropic steps if they're just good substantial planning steps for the financial well-being of your family and the estates that your family wishes to make certain they're secured i think you should do it i think this is the year particularly since RMD is now being taken and particularly since we don't know what the changes are going to be. Which brings me to a, a final point or two. Um, interest rates. We now have information that suggests that they're going to rise in 22. Fed has suggested that they're going to stop asset purchases to support the economy, which they're going to stop buying bonds. They're going to stop buying things that uh, kept things under bay. They're going to let inflation go where it may go, thinking it won't go too badly. Uh, there's going to be a formal announcement of this in November. It's going to be something all of us are going to watch. It. It's going to have tremendous impact on the stock market. It's going to have impact on any number of things, including inflation and what inflation is going to mean. Will inflation mean that interest rates will have to rise considerably, which means higher costs for us to borrow, higher costs for us to create mortgages for ourselves. But of course, maybe higher costs or higher returns on money markets and, uh, and other kind of cash investments, but I wouldn't bet on very much of that. IRS discount rate is very low right now, 1%. It's based upon midterm treasuries. That may go up. It impacts annuity rates, the discount rate for people under the age of 70. And lastly, for those of you who are thinking about how you manage your own assets, uh, is it ready? Are you ready now to take greater risk to get greater return? If interest rates go up or if markets continue to be volatile, there was a discussion today that October could be a dangerous month. Fortunately, we're at 13 October, so maybe the markets can weather October. As you know, historically, October has always been a very volatile month for the U.S. stock markets. But here's hoping that the Fed and, and sadly will prevail and we won't have lots of bumps and bruises during the course of the month of October. So if that's all the case, I do urge you to consider looking at some of the vehicles that are available to lock in interest rates, whatever it is. And again, although my disposition is to encourage you to think about charitable gift annuities because they have very substantial rates, because there is a future benefit for the charity that you believe in, because so much of the income you get on these annuities from a charitable gift annuity is annually tax-free, good reasons to be thinking about it, even if you're only looking at it as a 
investment planning perspective, as a fixed income perspective, something to look at. Look at that and look at it as it compares to other kinds of vehicles. Look at it as like a lifetime bond. A lifetime bond, they'll pay you a fixed rate for the rest of your lifetime. People say, well, does it cover inflation? Well, it doesn't have, does not have an inflation adjustment, but it does have an insurance, assurance piece to it that you'll know you're going to have income. Lots of individuals at retirement time think of these for themselves, and lots of individuals before retirement think of these by buying what is called a deferred annuity that locks in a rate now and pays them later, maybe at age 72 when they have to start RMDs or maybe when they're starting to take Social Security. So and Neil, if I, if, I, if I understand this correctly, because we, we have a number of donors that, that um, do what I call chari charitable retirement income planning with us via these CGAs. So it's a very tax efficient vehicle, correct? You can fund it with appreciated assets and then receive income for the rest of your life that's guaranteed and you don't have to worry about fluctuations in the market. Absolutely right. Uh, cash is the best use of, uh, best contribution because it generates so much tax-free income. People use appreciated security, some of the gain, some of the gain, not all of it, some of the gain is allocated in installments in your annual annuity payments. We can calculate all that for you. You can make a decision whether cash or appreciated securities is best. Remember also, because it's also a life income plan, that a contribution of highly appreciated property, real estate, securities, works of art to a charitable remainder trust avoids all initial tax on the capital gain, but it's for a larger ticket item. People who do charitable gift annuities, Doug, are people who do them one at age 72, we do one at 74, we do one at 76, and they get this kind of blended rate because over the years, each time they do a new one, the rate for that one is higher than the prior one. It's kind of like laddering purchases of bonds. So you're absolutely right. Lots of reasons to do it, not the least of which is the profit in quotes for a gift for an annuity goes to an insurance company if you buy it commercially. The profit in quotes in a gift annuity goes to the charity to do its important work. And most of you, I'm sure many, all of you probably believe that we all want to try to leave the world a little better than we found it. And a gift annuity is one way to do it. We're, sh we're showing a chart on our uh, charitable gift annuity rates. They're, they're very, very competitive. Yes. And uh, I think you want to know that information. Calculations can be obtained easily. There are no obligations. A gift annuity can be one life, can be two lives, can be spouses, can be parent and adult child, can be siblings. I did one this morning for an individual who created a gift annuity for his brother who's age 65 because his brother really needs some income for life. Uh, I've done one for uncles and nephews where the rate is based upon the younger person's age, but the uncle was so happy to know his nephew would have income for life. Uh, these are things you want to explore. And again, exploring them doesn't create obligation. It creates information. And A4BGU is a really good place to get this information because you'll see the rates and you'll see how it works. All you left to say, Doug, because I know we're over, is um, a lot of the things we're talking about will change. Uh, you would say, will change is October 13th. It could be in November, we've got more information. It could be by November 15th, after the Fed decides what to do about interest rates and the Fed decides what to do about asset repurchase, it could be that we'll have a pretty defined picture of where the tax laws are going to be in 22. So even though we might not do another webinar between now and then, we're going to be sending out e-blasts and other kinds of information on a regular basis from A4BGU so that you, those of you who are on our list today, and there are many of you, even those of you who didn't attend today who will hear from us, will have information that says, here's what we know today. Here's what we know that we can tell you. We're concerned about the tax laws, particularly for people like you who support A4BGU and other charities, because those tax laws make a great deal of difference in how you move your assets from generation to generation. Step up and basis is scary if it's eliminated. The 10 year rule now, the elimination of the stretch IRA for many families is a real dilemma interest rates and whether you're going to have adequate income for life is a problem. Interest rates, excuse me, tax rates going up. And lastly, 
how much of an estate will be exempt from tax in light of the new tax law? Will it go back to where it was low and make so much of our estates taxable when we bargained that they wouldn't be? If that's the case, pay close attention. We'll talk with more about this with, from, with you, but do something before the end of the year, whatever it may be, talk to your advisors, call us, they'll give you the email address, we'll help you some more. Doug, I think yep. it's okay. a long time. Thank you very much, Neil. And we're gonna we're gonna wrap up now. Although we held the audience almost this full time, so you, you did great. And people have a lot of questions. If you haven't, if you do have a question still, please write to us at Plan Giving at AmericansforBGU.org or at the phone number that's listed on the screen. Um, of course, that that's that's Neil's uh, cell phone, so you can text him too. No, that, that's an office line. But please call us if, if you have questions. We are here help. Okay, Melody, I think you can stop the share. So David Ben-Gurion, the founder and first prime minister of Israel and the guy who we are fortunate to have as the namesake of our university, once said that if an expert says it can't be done, find another expert. But in this case, Neil, you're helping us out. Very complicated. You're the right expert um, and we're greatly appreciative. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Neil, thank you for, for your talk and for your expertise. Everybody stay safe and be healthy. Thank you, Doug. Goodbye, everybody.